Alrighty, welcome back to day two of the EconX FBLA speaker series. Um, we're taking this week to explore kind of the real world applications of economics and the intersection between economics and entrepreneurship. Um, this is uh, co-hosted by each individual club, um, so you'll be able to earn points for both clubs at the end of the at the end of the speaker series. Um, the speaker series is also recorded, um, so if you would like to check it out at a later date, you can find it on YouTube at the Limbrook Economics YouTube channel. Yeah, so again, just a quick timeline of our speakers. Yesterday we had Chris Maurice come um, and he was the CEO of Yellow Card Financial. And today we're, we'll be having Professor Cohen come um, from now to about 10, 11 a.m. And Thursday we'll be having Oagu Perianan come um, during lunchtime. And on Friday we'll be having Professor Tadellis come after school from 3.40 to 4.25 p.m. And all these professors all these speakers will come using the same link. And if you want to find more information about all these speakers, they're on our Instagram at Lindbergh Economics. So just um, a couple of quick norms. So you can ask questions through the chat feature, either publicly or privately to me, Cindy Chow. Um, you don't need to private message the speakers. And feel free to send them in any time during the event if you're confused about something. But most of them will be answered um, at the end. And if possible, keep cameras on. Um, to show respect for our speaker and stay muted while the speaker is talking. Um, listen and be respectful. And um, just a heads up, this event will be recorded as Ian said, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Yeah, so um, today's speaker is Professor Cohen. Um, she's an economics professor at UC San Diego, um, a research associate at National Bureau of Economic Research, and also the associate editor of an, um, International Tax and Public Finance. Her primary, primary field of interest is public economics with specializations in the economics of education, government policies, and behavior responses to taxation and social insurance. And her work has been published in many leading journals like Econometrica and Journal of Labor Economics. Yeah, so welcome, Professor Cohen. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, one of my goals for today is just to give you all a sense of the breadth of economics. So when I'm uh, on an airplane and someone finds out I'm an economist, the first thing they ask me about is how the stock market's doing. And uh, I should tell you, I, I know less well than you do about the stock market. And so the area of economics that I'm in is really more related to studying how uh, individuals and firms respond to incentives. So it's a little bit more like um, psychology or sociology with data uh, than some visions people have that's much more about the macroeconomy. So what I want to do is just give you a first uh, quick overview of how I ended up where I am. So how did I become an economist? And then I uh, want to give you an overview of a couple, I'm just picking one research area that I work in, give you an overview of some of the projects and the methods that we use, okay, to give you a sense of uh, what people in my field might study. So my, my background is, uh, as an undergraduate, I was kind of a uh, generalist, so I was studying English, math, and French, and wasn't really sure what I was going to go on to um, after getting my degree the types of firms that were interested in interviewing me, so I went into the Career Center, uh, were consulting firms, and, and which, which sounded fun because you get to kind of sample different settings. So I went into interview with this consulting firm and uh, they didn't show up. And so they said, well, you know, the Peace Corps is here and their interviewee didn't show up, so why don't you just practice? And so I went into practice with Peace Corps and they happened to have a position at the time that would be teaching English and math in French in Zaire. And uh, you know, if it hadn't sounded so perfect, I don't think it would have happened, but I signed up. And uh, <laughs> then a couple months later, uh, it turned out not to be politically feasible to go to Zaire. And so they asked me to go to Guatemala to teach agriculture in Spanish which naturally I did. <laughs> so uh, after that experience, which, which really was, it was uh, such a hands-on and kind of growth experience for me. When I came back, I knew I wanted to get more schooling, but wanted to do something that was of more practical relevance, let's say then continuing in English. And so I, I went back to get a PhD in economics at MIT at the time. And so what uh, the field that I chose to study is called, um, as Cindy said, it's called public economics. 
what public economics is about, it's about um, studying the role of government in the economy. Okay, so both from the expenditure side, so all the spending programs you can think the government does, and the revenue side, which is how do you raise revenues. So I, I'm not sure how much background you have at this point in economics, but the introductory economics is usually about explaining to people how the market works and the really positive aspects of the market when all of the assumptions hold. You know, that under certain assumptions, the market yields an efficient outcome. So it has some desirable properties. A lot of what public economics is about is when those assumptions fail, the market actually doesn't do a good job. Okay, and government intervention is justified. Uh, and so there's both for efficiency enhancement enhancing reasons you might have government involvement. And we also care about things like equity. Okay, so both there may be both kind of uh, efficiency and equity justifications for the government getting uh, involved in the market. And so as soon as you, you know, so sort of an order of questions we ask in public economics is, you know, why should the government be involved and should it be involved now? What's the justification? If it is involved, what's the best way to be involved? And to, to evaluate what the best way to be involved is, we often need to estimate and practice like what happens. You know, so let's say that we think not enough people um, are getting vaccinated. So I'm just gonna throw something out there. You know, so vaccination is something, is a type of activity that we think the private market doesn't do well because when the private market does well, you're taking uh, you know, market signals like prices is given deciding you know what's in my best interest to do and so when you get vaccinated you take account of the cost to you the benefits to you make the decision but something like vaccination is something that has positive externalities but right? if you get vaccinated it protects not just you it protects other people and so the fact that you know those are the prices that you face or the incentives that you face mean that we don't get enough vaccination taking place uh, so the you know but as soon as we say that okay how do we then want to increase vaccination vaccination we could do public provision of vaccines. We could try to subsidize it. And then in practice, we need to estimate what's the impact of any one of these interventions because it depends on how people react. And so that's a lot of what I do is it's, you know, trying to literally estimate using real world data, what happens, you know, what was an impact of a policy and often the policy has an intended consequence. And then there can be all sorts of unintended consequences. And I find the unintended consequences really interesting. So for people who study what I do, so study public economics, the types of jobs that they go into, so ac academics is a very common uh, field for people to go into, but if not academics, um, there's a lot of, um, this, that's my dog, sorry about that. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, uh, think tank positions, government positions where you might be analyzing policies. And because there's such an emphasis on using data to estimate causal impacts, that those skills, you know, just evaluating the causal impact of anything, carry over to a lot of jobs in uh, current tech firms like, uh, like Amazon, uh, Google, you know, so a lot of our PhD students end up going into the private sector as well. Of course, economic consulting is always an option too. Okay, so what I, what I wanna take uh, uh, the uh, rest of the time to talk about is uh, one of the areas that I've done a lot of work on that I thought might be relevant to you given the stage you're at is uh, research on economics of education and government involvement in K through 12. Again, education at that level is one of the biggest spending programs of state and local government. And so it's a huge government expenditure program. And uh, something that's really interesting about education that's shared with health as well. Like if you're, I know a lot of you are coming at this from business angles. And so you think about firms and firms producing things, often the production process is something that it's kind of easy to observe, right? You're working at Target, you're working in fulfillment, you've got to get a certain number of items in a certain number of boxes as fast as you can, right? You can see the production process, you can measure it really easily. Education is not like that, right? You can often see the inputs, so you can see things like class size, technology. Uh, you can see the, some of the outputs. So you can see you know, how students are achieving, how many uh, students from a given school go on to college. But the actual production process is really hard to characterize, really hard to observe, really hard to quantify. And so a lot of the interventions in education, if you think of the production process in the middle, have come at the beginning. Like, let's just mandate the inputs. 
right? We can see those. So like in California, for example, we've had mandates on minimum, um, sorry, maximum class sizes, but you can't have a class size larger than a certain amount that's trying to control the quality. Um, we've also skipped the, the whole thing that's going on in the middle and mandated outputs. Right, said, you know, we're going to uh, require schools to have uh, graduation rates of a certain level, or we're going to grade you as a school on how your students perform on these standardized exams. Okay, and that those same sorts of government interventions have been used in health, right? And health is the same thing, right? That it's very hard to mechanize what health professionals do. And so we've done the same things. We've mandated, you know, minimum staffing ratios that you have to have a certain number of nurses in a hospital. And mandated outputs like uh, hospitals now are evaluated based on things like um, death rates, right, mortality rates. Okay, and in both of these settings, something that's super interesting is that the, you know, what happens, you know, as far as the outcomes depends really heavily on the case mix, right? So whether you're serving in, uh, for example, in the school setting, are you serving advantaged students? In the hospital setting, you know, are you serving a lot of sickly or elderly individuals? And so how you factor that into how you're going to evaluate schools or try to help them improve productivity is, is super important. And so I'll, um, in the education setting, there've been a lot of concerns about, you know, because this uh, production process is hard to see and in the public sector, the incentives for really using dollars effectively are, are a lot more muted. There's been a lot of concern with increasing the efficiency of provision, okay, as well as concerns about equity you know, guaranteeing that students, regardless of what their background is, have access to at least some minimum standard of education. And so that's uh, a, a lot of my research has tried to evaluate some of the interventions that have either tried to make schools more effective or tried to make schools more equitable, you know, make sure that uh, there's equal access. And so I'll, I was, if we have time, I don't have to get through all the projects, I was going to talk about three projects. And my goal is just to give you a sense of the types of policies you could study and the types of methods that we use, because the methods are, are the thing that really generalize, generalize. And so one project that I have was studying the effect of school choice. Okay, and so what, why do we have school choice? One argument for it, which is, you know, that rather than having to go to your neighborhood school, you can pick schools that are in other parts of your school district. One of the arguments for that is that it injects a kind of competitive pressure into schools. Right, the schools now have to compete with each other. Okay, so it puts pressure on, on trying to use resources more effectively. It also can serve an equity um, role because students who, you know, we know that people sort across neighborhoods by income based on the housing that you can afford. Okay, so you tend to get, you know, clustering by income levels, by neighborhoods. So if you only have access to neighborhood choice, then you're really going to have, uh, you know, people with very different peer groups based on where you're, where you can afford to live. Okay, so opening up choice so people can attend schools that aren't in their neighborhood also can help to serve this kind of uh, equity role. And so one, uh, this project that I was going to describe is looking at the Chicago public schools, and at, when students are going from eighth to ninth grade, they can actually apply to attend any one of the high schools that are in the Chicago area. Okay, so any single one of them. Uh, and so what the question we were asking is, if a student is able to attend a school that looks like a much stronger school, okay, so you can think of high schools as being rated by their achievement levels, because we're going to have very high achieving high schools and much lower achieving high schools. Okay, so if I can attend a higher achieving school, how does that causally change my outcomes? Okay, do I do better than I otherwise would do? Okay, and that's a causal question. You know, how does, is my outcome changed? by attending one school compared to the other. And so that's kind of getting at the methods. Okay, so if you were just to compare outcomes, right? So you see two kids, one chooses to go to a very high achieving school, one goes to a lower achieving school, and you follow them over time, you, you would expect their outcomes be different for a whole variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the school they attended, right? What led a child to make that decision? Maybe it's more advantaged parents, more involved parents, that are able to you know, take advantage of these choice options and things like that. And so the strategy we use to get at causal effects is that in um, Chicago for the high schools that are oversubscribed, so if more students apply than they can accept, they literally use a lottery. Okay, so it's like a coin flip, whether you get into that high school or not. And so then what we could do if it's a coin flip, 
you know, and this is almost like, a, it's called the randomized controlled trial, but it's almost like in the medical profession, right? That you can have treatment and control groups. Some get the drug, some don't get the drug for random reasons. And so we're using that exact design where there's a lottery. So we have the set of applicants. If you just randomly put them into groups of, hey, you're the winners, you get to go to this school. And hey, you're the losers, you don't get to go to this school that by design, they otherwise should have completely identical outcomes, right? Absent this intervention, because we just flipped a coin, they're in these groups. And so then we can follow these students forward and see what happens in the long run. So does attending this better school, it looks better, improve their outcomes or not? And the super surprising finding we had is that it didn't. Okay, that the students that were able to attend a much higher achieving school didn't have any better outcomes than the ones that were attending a lower achieving school. So part of what was happening is you know, so we tried to break it down into all of these different mechanisms is that the students who went to the lower achieving school were uh, kind of tracked to the top classes, right? So they were, it was sort of like, a, what do they call it? Big fish, small pond kind of thing. <laughs> and that actually benefited them where the kids who were going to the higher achieving school were, were tracked kind of lower classes in that school. And so anyway, but the interesting thing is we just, uh, once you could control super well for all the things you can't otherwise see, like unobserved motivation, parental background, which we could with our design, we found that what you thought would have, you know, we expected to find big effects on outcomes and then to decompose it, we just found it turned out not to really matter, which, which I thought was a super interesting finding and really hard to tell from observational data. You know, and so the good schools, our, our conclusion was the good schools served good kids. You know, and that's why that's why they did better. It's not because they did anything better with the good uh, good kids. So good kids like you guys. Uh, so the uh, so that's just one example. But that's sort of like the people call it the gold standard in trying to identify causal effects is when you when you have something that's sort of like a true experiment. Okay, they have people randomly assigned to treatment, people randomly assigned to control, and then the other kinds of methods that we use are referred to as quasi experiments. Okay, where we're trying to find something else in the world that can give us, it can kind of reproduce um, some sort of random reason why one person gets one treatment and another person doesn't. And so I'll just give you two, two more examples of methods. So another project that I was looking at is studying school accountability. So it's grading schools, you know, signing, this is in Texas where it's sort of like giving letters A to F to schools based on how the schools perform. And uh, it's based on a whole variety of dimensions, like the pass rates on math standardized exams, reading, social studies, and all of these different subgroups. So a bunch of different student subgroups have to achieve certain performance standards to get, you know, to move up in the ratings. So what's interesting is in, in Texas, despite the, their efforts to try to make the ratings reflect, um, you know, value added, how much a school is kind of improving outcomes, it turns back the rating system kind of just spits back to you performance levels. So if you're a school that's serving disadvantaged students, even if you're helping to improve their scores, you're quite likely to be rated as, as a bad school. Okay, so it's just one thing that's true about the way the system works. And so what we're showing in this paper is the strategy is that we, they call it a running variable. So we can calculate you know, how you're doing on this metric of uh, your school rating, right? So there's some underlying variable that's a composite of all of your test scores. And you know, as this gets higher, you, you jump the threshold to being moving up from an F to a D as a school, then you jump up from being you know, a D to a C. You know, but it's a very complex variable that determines this. And so what we can do is you can look at schools that after all the test scores come in are just barely on the margin of being an F, let's say, or being a D. Right, so they're very, very close to uh, performing exactly the same as each other. And it's almost like a coin flip. Did the school get the D or did the school get the F? Okay, so it's this, this strategy is called regression discontinuity. You know, so you basically have this nice smooth variable, which is how is this composite score evolving? But then when the score moves just a tiny bit over, you know, epsilon above a level, you jump into being classified as a different, you know, now you're a D school, not an F school. And so you can compare... Um, schools that are right on that boundary and, and look at, you know, are outcomes systematically different? If they are, it's not because those schools are systematically different. They're epsilon different from each other. What's different is one's been called an F school, one's been called a D school. And so we've looked at, at that to try to study um, principal labor market outcomes. Okay, so we found that if you look at school principals who are leading schools that barely fail, 
and barely get a D, barely failing, you're not any different. Your labor market, labor market outcomes are hugely different. If 45% lose their jobs compared to, you know, a very small fraction of those that for lucky reasons, you know, escaped that F rating. Okay, so, so our, our argument in this paper is we can show, we can estimate like uh, actual principal effectiveness. Okay, and what we do is we use um, value added on test scores. Okay, so we'll see how, do you, how well are you raising student test scores given, you know, how they show up at your school at the beginning of, you know, the, the ability they bring with them basically. So we can show that effective principals are equally distributed across like these A through F schools and the principles that are on the margin of getting an F versus a D are no differentially effective. Okay, but the one that's unlucky and gets this bad draw, you know, is really, really likely to have kind of bad future labor market outcomes. So the implication is the system that's not designed very well, makes it very hard for uh, disadvantaged schools to attract, uh, you, you know, just it just makes it even uh, harder to staff problem. Okay, because you're asking someone who decides to lead one of these schools to take on the risk of getting this bad luck draw and losing their job. Okay, but just another example of a totally different question, right? But uh, in a different method we can use to get at the causal effect of what happens if you get a bad rating. Okay, and the last paper that I'll mention is uh, one that's looking at, so another major intervention within K through 12 schooling is school finance reform. And it used to be in the US that uh, schools were primarily locally financed, so just by property taxes. And one of the concerns is that that led to very inequitable levels of per pupil resources across schools. As you have rich schools and poor schools. And so there was a movement towards school finance equalization where states got highly involved. And California was actually one of the early movers. So now in California, our property taxes is still, you, you might think it's still local. Okay, there's a local property tax. The money goes up to uh, Sacramento, then comes back to schools, according to a formula. Okay, so it's very um, centralized on the resource uh, allocation side. So one of the interesting things with this is when the state is trying to allocate funds back to schools and be fair, is again, you wanna account for the case mix, right? That not if you're serving more disadvantaged students that are more costly to educate, then you're gonna need more resources to achieve the same outcomes. And same thing in a hospital setting, right? If you're serving a lot of heart attack patients compared to kids, you know, getting pediatric stuff, you're gonna need more funding. And so when these funds come back, uh, the, this study that I'm thinking of was done in Texas, is uh, you basically, they take pupils and or students, give them numbers. So if you're just a regular education, regular old body, you're, you count as one. If you have special needs, you know, that you can think of, uh, you might be learning disabled, uh, maybe even more severe disabilities, you might count as two students all the way up to, you know, maybe 10 students if you, if you really have um, a severe disability. Okay, so there's a weighted pupil count that then um, in Texas, the state says, okay, I'm going to guarantee you, let's say it's $2,500 per weighted pupil. Okay, so I'm kind of weighting up by your case mix, right, that even more costly to educate case, case mix. Okay, so Texas had that kind of system, and there was a um, a major reform that really had nothing to do with special education, which is the special, you know, the number of kids who are in these special needs programs. And the goal was, actually it's probably not important for you to know the goal, but the interesting thing, so this is another strategy that we use to get at causal effects, is people wanted to know, does that weighting formula, you know, the fact that we say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you extra money, you know, through this counting, does it inflate special education programs? Okay, are students being labeled as special needs because they generate money, not because you know, that's in the best interests of the kids. Okay, and you can think of it the same thing in the hospital setting as hospitals might play around with classification of someone who comes in, right? Might upgrade uh, someone's medical status because it's gonna generate more money from me, right? Or I might provide more treatments than I otherwise would because of the reimbursement rules. Okay, so the same concern with special ed in Texas was, are we inflating special ed populations by the way we're providing funds? Okay, it was very hard to tell without some sort of variation. And so what, what um, I used in this paper is there was a policy reform that shifted state involvement in a way that for reasons unrelated to special education across different districts. So this method is uh, called difference in difference or uh, policy reform. So what the policy change did is from before to after the change, 
across low wealth districts and high wealth districts, some districts had big increases in how much extra money they would get if their pupil count got bigger. Okay, which, which just means there was a, a change, differential change in incentives across um, districts. So some all of a sudden had a much greater incentive to label marginal students as disabled. Some had a much reduced incentive to label students as uh, disabled. So you can think of that again as a treatment and control, right, but induced by the policy change. Okay, so the policy changed some higher incentives now, some lower incentives. And what I found is that the special education populations in, bloomed up in places where the incentives went up, shrunk in places where the incentives went down. Okay, you can see clearly this is some, a behavior that's very sensitive to uh, incentives. Okay, then just, so just sensibly a couple of the methods, right? So the quasi experiments and the questions. And so I know we're getting close to the end. So I, I wanted to finish by saying, you know, that that's only one branch of my agenda. So I've done a lot within economics of education, but I've also, I heard you mention entrepreneurship, um, done work looking at uh, the design of the tax system and how that affects risk-taking. So whether people are willing to take on risky ventures. Um, I've done work looking at tax evasion. Okay, where a lot of the way tax evasion is modeled standardly in economics is as a financial gamble. It's like any financial crime is I trade off the gains you know, versus the possible losses if I get caught. Um, I've also done work studying uh, design of unemployment insurance programs where they're one of the, one of the key issues. It is if the public sector steps in and provides more income to kind of to make up to your lost wages, right? So I'm gonna give you unemployment insurance benefits that is gonna crowd out things you might've done to protect yourself, like savings or spousal labor supply, kid labor supply. Uh, and and to, the, to the extent that those interact with each other, it affects how big the public program should be. So anyway, it's a, the thing I like about public economics and I like about economics is it's a very, um, method, it's, it's like a science in the methods. It's a very, formal and how we think about the questions, the methods that we use, but very broad uh, in terms of the types of issues that you can study. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Collins. It's great to hear. Um, so now we're going to move into our um, question portion. So um, the first question we have is, do you have any advice for people who are really unsure of what they want to pursue in the future? How did you know you wanted to change your major to study economics instead of what you started off with? So that is that is a really hard one. Uh, I, to be honest, I read a book that was called Working. This was back in, you know, from the 1980s. <laughs> but it, it was like a thousand page book that when you read it, every uh, section was someone describing this is what my life, you know, this is what I actually do in my job. And so it was, it was like just clarifying this is what this job is like. I don't really think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of aptitude, like work aptitude tests that you can take. I don't know if, if you've seen any of these where you can, I, so I think it depends on who you are. For me, I'm less of a real specialized person and more like a jack of all trades which made it even harder kind of to know what to do. And so I did take those aptitude tests and they'll tell you, okay, this is kind of the combination of skills that you'll be, you know, jobs that have these combinations of skills, you'll be more likely to be happy with. And then you can start researching these occupation directories. So it's called like um, ONET, I think. But those kinds of resources I think can be really valuable where you're just trying to self-assess like, what do I like? What am I good at? And then you know, other people have done the cross-matching between your skill assessment and the types of jobs that would suit you. But to be honest, I, I think it's really hard to pre-plan things like a career path than most everyone I know, including, you know, I more commonly now work with undergraduates and graduate students, is a lot of it's happenstance, sort of like, you know, my path through Peace Corps, that as life kind of hits you with opportunities or you're, or you're in a major, you know, and there's a lot of breadth within any major anyway, you know, so say you're within a psychology major, what you'll find is you don't like 80% of the classes. And then you start finding that there's that 20% that starts to intrigue you. And, and those are the, you know, so I guess I would say follow the things that you find interesting because those are the ones that are gonna have longevity for you. You know, and that you wanna to continue to be an expert. I remember someone telling me there, who's a water chemist now, he started chemistry and was like, oh, I hate it, I hate it. This isn't working for me. And then got into water chemistry, like one class. It was like, ooh, I like this. You know, so my feeling is probably there's there's a lot of overlap across fields in where your interests lie. 
And there's no real way to define that except through experimentation, but there's very few choices you can make that are gonna close down doors. You know, so within chemistry he found water, he might've found water within a conservation class or, or something else. You know I mean, so, so I wouldn't, I don't think you can plan too strongly, but I do recommend these um, kind of job related skill assessments or occupation related skill assessments. Yeah, um, so the next question is a short one. It's um, what are your views on stimulus? So you, this is getting a little outside of my expertise, as I said at the beginning. So there's, uh, it, it's interesting because public economics, the field I'm in, early on, like so back, uh, you know, before like the last 30 years, I would say, had a, a lot of macroeconomics involved and people were studying things like how do we stimulate the economy, monetary policy was related, and then it moved out of my field. Okay, so macroeconomics was really dealing with these issues and only recently has it come back in where people are trying to estimate, here's the impact of the stimulus payments, here's how much extra dollars we got out of it. And so I think there's, um, so, I'll, so I'm, I'll tell you what I think, but you should know that this is not an area that I'm an expert in. Okay, so what, so what I think based on the things that I've read is that uh, stimulus can be super effective if it's well targeted, right? So there's a lot of studies showing that so there's, I don't know if these words you've heard yet, like marginal and inframarginal. So inframarginal is things that you do that just don't change anything. Okay, so inframarginal is giving money to people who were going to spend the same amount they're spending anyway, right? So the, a lot of the goal is to try to boost spending. Okay, so, but if you can target the dollars to people who, when you give them money, are going to spend a lot of it, that's where you're going to get the bigger bang for the buck. And so that's what I've seen is people evaluating different types of stimulus payments and in some cases finding very little benefits from the stimulus, but because it's not very well targeted. Okay, but if you target it to people who have a high so it's got marginal propensity to consume, you know, then it can be quite effective at, at stimulating the economy. So I don't know if that got at all at the types of issue the person who posed that had in mind. All right, uh, the next question is, who is one person that you look up to the most? In, as an economist? Um, this person didn't say, but I'm guessing. Okay, now. okay, I'll go. Uh, so probably um, one, so it's actually someone who I'm still uh, currently a colleague with is Roger Gordon. So he's, he's among the fathers of public economics. And one of the things that I really admire about him is he's, motivated by real world puzzles. And so he's, he's partly taken, he's an applied theorist uh, and has modeled you know, optimal tax systems, how should tax systems be designed? And the theory was, uh, classic theory comes from developed country contexts. And then he's done a lot of traveling in China and you know, India, so lots of different countries where he's just like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, and you'd see things, you know, and you'd see uh, developed country institutions coming in and saying, this is what you should do, like including things like the value added tax, which is a VAT, you know, that this is this is a self-enforcing tax, you know, so all the developed country, developing countries should be taking this tax on. And so what people have shown is that in these contexts where you have um, a lot less state capacity, that things that, sh you know, should work in a certain way just don't work in a certain way. And so he's really taken the public economics theory and adapted it to try to, you know, take account of the real world um, kind of political and enforcement constraints that come about in developing country context. So I admire him for his motivation by real world puzzles. You know, so I'll see somebody's like, this just, this doesn't make sense. I want to figure out, you know, puzzle on this and come up with what should happen in this circumstance. And then he's, um, you know, both a theorist who then takes his uh, findings to the governments. You know, so he's been quite influential uh, in the policies that different countries have implemented. And he, I, my first position, I didn't say this, uh, after a graduate school as I was on the faculty of University of Michigan. So Roger Gordon moved to UCSD and then a couple years later he said, come on over. <laughs> so I came. <laughs> so he, yes, an incredible colleague, but an incredible economist. Okay, cool. Um, the next question is, um, what does the data that you collect about education look like and how is important is the quality of data? So, so quality of data, hugely important. And, and that, that's actually one of the big recent changes in economics is the access to really rich micro data sets. 
So the work I did on tax evasion is actually using the universe of uh, tax returns from like 10 years. You know, so we, we were working with um, someone who's inside the IRS. Den uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden have attracted a huge amount of resource research because you, you know, basically their data on individuals is absolutely comprehensive. As you see people from when they were born, you can see every drug they've ever taken through their, because public health insurance is completely free, all of the education records, earnings. You know, so it's just a super rich data uh, that people are able to use. What I've been working with mostly is, um, so many of the questions that I ask, like the ones about, you know, how does the school respond to funding? I actually can work with uh, aggregate data. You know, so I've used Texas administrative data that any one of you could find on the web. You know, so it's AEIS was the name of the group, but it, they have school by year, uh, very comprehensive data that the schools have to report. Some of the research I've done, like what I was describing on the school principals, you know, we want to be able to track individual principals over time or to estimate, um, you know, value added, where I really need student level data to see how a student's improving. So those type of data are increasingly available through data agreement plans because I currently have access to restricted use data at uh, UT Austin, that uh, uh, the, probably one of the few positive side effects of the pandemic is I can now access it from here. You know, but, but so the data is huge. So the kinds of questions you can answer, the strategies you can use, like how convincing the strategies depend uh, immensely on the data. But that's one of the really exciting things is kind of the big data movement and economists are, are uh, at the fore of that. So that's what, what I was saying in the beginning about a lot of our PhD students and actually uh, undergraduates going into technology jobs is because they have this toolkit, right? Which is causal identification, right? And what Amazon might wanna know what's gonna happen if I change the shipping charge from $5 to $10. You know, and you want someone who's used to thinking about these sort of experimental designs so you can get a good um, causal estimate of these types of policies. Oh, cool. So the next question is, what are some research opportunities that um, high school students can participate in for economics? And I know you mentioned working with um, high school students around here, too, and like maybe you could talk about what you guys are doing. Yeah, sure. There's um, so I think I, I don't I, there's I'm sure there's more opportunities that I'm aware of. But there's um, the ways that I've gotten involved with high school students before is partly what you guys did where you just take the initiative and reach out. So I've had students write and say, you know, I'm uh, uh, really excited about economics, thinking about majoring in it. Uh, and I would love to be able to help you out in any way that I can in your research. Here's the type of skills that I've had. And I've, I've had really great luck with, um, with strong students. So there's um, a woman I've been working with now for maybe two years who, but, I, but to be clear, it's been volunteer. You know, so, but, but I, for example, I wrote a, a recommendation letter for her. So I was going to say that's, that's probably the trade-off as I wrote a recommendation letter for her to colleges and she's had an excellent outcome. Um, but I could say, you know, credibly, like I can see that she's as good as any undergraduate I've worked with, you know, so I think the letter carries a lot of weight, but, but so I think you have to be proactive. There may be other opportunities, but you could reach out to academics. Like I noticed one of the academics who responded to you is local, right? So thinking about the universities that are near to you guys, uh, and, and putting feelers out, uh, but then just ask, asking someone, you know, I'd be, especially now that, that everyone's more com uh, comfortable with the remote environment, it kind of broadens the scope of people you could plausibly reach out to. Because the student I was talking about, I actually have never met in person. And we've just met virtually. But the types of things she's helped me with is I have a project, so this is using Danish data, where we're trying to look at the role of providers in vaccine compliance. Okay, and this is, again, so the way to say, like, this is a provider who's good at getting people to get the vaccines they're supposed to get versus not, is we're using a design where we can track patients. Like, so kids, you know, there's a schedule they're supposed to get between ages zero and six as they move across doctors. And so we can basically control for, here's the family's propensity to get vaccinated. Because we have the same people over time, but then we're just identifying what happens to them when they change doctors, right? Do they... Are they then more compliant or less compliant? So it's kind of a design where we can separate patient uh, proclivities from provider proclivities. Um, but so she's helped me for that, for example, gather some of the background was about in, in Denmark, vaccine compliance is actually quite high. And there's one vaccine 
that's um, problematic, which is HPV. You guys might be aware of it's a relatively new vaccine. Uh, and in Denmark, there was a media event. So one of these kind of documentaries about side effects that led, they, they had 80% take up, it dropped to 40%. So we can show that these higher propensity or low, actually we, we, call, we have the bad apple doctors. The bad apple doctors are the ones whose patients just plummeted after that media event. So there's, their patients were much less likely to get the HPV. But so she was helping us research, you know, how does Denmark fit into other countries? So gathering data on vaccination rates across different countries and then putting those together in figures for us. Um, we were doing work on, you know, she, she was doing a literature review. So trying to study what other people have looked up as far as providers and vaccination or even, you know, complementary to that for us was like the patient side. You know, what have people found about patients makes them more and less likely to comply with vaccination. Um, she's helped in a separate project. I'm looking at tracking in schools. So the extent to which kids are tracked by achievement in schools. And she's been helping, you know, she takes the data from me and we can see in the data, it looks like this school started tracking a lot more. And then she'll go to their websites and try to identify policy documents. You know, so we can say, ah, you know, this shows up in their policy documents uh, in this way. And so I'd say she's done, uh, she's used data. So she's done empirical analysis, literature reviews and um, data gathering and policy document gathering. But I would say the most effective thing to do is to um, to be to reach out, you know, think about what your interests are. So something that turns me off, like if someone reaches out to me and says, uh, you know, I'm really interested in marketing uh, and I'd love to help you through research. Like to me, that shows they don't know what I do. Not, not that it's I mean, but it doesn't matter. Then you just won't get a response. You know I mean, so you get a response from people who your reach out is appropriate, but she would want to look at the person's profile and have a reason why you think you might be a match where your interests are. And then I think you're much more likely to get a response. Okay, thank you. I think that wraps up the question. Um, we have another question, but um, do you have time? Or yeah, you have, you have, have time? to stay. Sure. All right. Um, so as a follow up, um, someone asked, what skills do you look for in students in research, like EVA with R or SAS? Can, can you say those again? Um, like EVA Oh, oh or... as far as which programs they're comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, so the person that I'm, I work with Stata, which is uh, not common outside of academics because it's expensive. And so I think um, more common now, and probably more among even younger generation economists than me, is using more freeware. Like probably are um, the nice thing about Stata is um, that the methods keep advancing, and then Stata is really good with user-defined algorithms. And so if there's a new estimator, a user might develop it for a paper and implement it, and then it gets integrated in the software really quickly. So it's it's nice for me to stay at the frontier on the method side. But for example, um, Kelly, the person I'm working with, did not have any background in Stata. I, I paid for Stata for her and then pointed her to some tutorials and some, you know, gave her some of my programs and then we just walked through it. So I was happy to, I would say what I look for is, um, I guess, really important that the person is um, careful, you know, documents what they do really well uh, and a willingness to learn, you know, where if I, like, for example, if I said to her, try do this tutorial in Stata, that she actually did it, you know, and tried to learn it and wanted to learn it. So I'd say, I'd say more important to me is, you know, she also sent along her CV, or uh, I think you guys call it resume, uh, you know, which showed, you know, I could see, oh, okay, she's someone who's, you know, skilled, she's sharp, she's going to be able, but then she and I met um, through Zoom, you know, and I could just tell talking to her that she was open and willing to work on things. So I, so I would say it's more like a willingness and ability than specific skills. And, and some people, like if they, they might say, oh, this project's in, um, but I was going to say, if you know R, I, I, I just think the, yes, yes, they have their program specific languages, but if you understand how to program in anything, you can program in anything else. And so I, I, I would express a willingness to learn different languages. And, and then I don't think the specific skills will matter. But it could be true that some professors are like, this This is happening in this front. And if you don't already know how to do it, um, I wouldn't consider you. But I personally would assume if someone can program an R, I could teach them in a day how to do the same thing in Stata. All right, thank you so much. Um...